Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. It's Friday. Party time. Party time. Yeah. I mean, Tony, you're on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. So you're uh, you're like that much closer to celebratory a celebratory weekend. That's that, what I think. That much, yeah, that much closer. So like, it's, yeah, it's a good Friday. Always a good Friday. Always a good Friday with you, Julia. Thank you. It, it, you know, you always give me something to think about and you always move me forward. And so I really enjoy these conversations. Um, and I know our viewers and listeners do as well. Today, it's a dicey conversation because we're going to be talking about dun, 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 money, compensation. Mm -hmm. We are a society that doesn't like to talk about this. Not in any sector, right? I mean, I don't think that in any sector folks mm -hmm. like talking about compensation, uh, but certainly in the nonprofit sector, it has been uh, something that was pretty much taboo and, <laughs> you know, historically. So I, I think we're at a, a great place now and we'll dive into this, to, you know, during the show today, but a, a great place uh, within the nonprofit sector where these conversations can be had and and are welcomed and, and received. Right. Well, something we must be doing. You know, we have this amazing group of people that support us, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is our day today, and then Nonprofit Thought Leader. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today and every Friday by Mr. Nonprofit himself, Tony Bell of Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Tony, I love your viewpoint because it's extremely, um, well, it's international, but it's extremely, you know, varied and national. I know you are such a thought leader across this country on so many things nonprofit. And uh, so, when you say something, I listen. I'm just saying. Well, that's <laughs> that's very kind of, of you, Julia. And, and you know, and, and my my desire is to you know elevate the sector in the best possible way that I can. And and so I'm always honored and and super feel super privileged to be part of the cadre of hosts that you have for the nonprofit show. And mm -hmm. and it's a super platform for folks to learn about what's happening in the entire nonprofit sector mm -hmm. and a great opportunity, you know, for fundraisers to tune in on Fridays and, and really hear topics that are, are more specific to their role mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in, in the nonprofit space. So thank you for the opportunity to, to do whatever I can to help elevate the sector and, and help folks feel more empowered about the work that they do. Yeah. I, I love this. And I think that, um, what's been cool about fundraisers friday is that it's not just about how to sell 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 or you know get the donation it's really about the ecosystem of how you work how you navigate how you are professional um and and so i just feel like this has been magical and and part of this really talks about our compensation so let's start off and you're going to tell us that salaries are various depending on the position what does well, yeah, that look like? yeah for sure and and first if you don't mind i want to start by celebrating those nonprofit organizations that when they do a job posting they include a salary range and we're okay. seeing that more and more as a best practice amongst mm -hmm. you know talent acquisition professionals is you know is, is putting the the salary range uh, you know, with the job posting, I think that that's really important and and vital information for folks as they consider either entering the nonprofit sector or as they consider leaving a current position. Uh, you know, and 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 how that compares without investing a lot of time in a process, only to get to be one of the final candidates and learn that the compensation, either in salary alone or the full compensation package, which I know we'll talk about also, only to learn it's not going to be suitable for them. So, mm -hmm. so at least posting the salary range up front uh, saves everyone a lot of time. 
Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I think we forget that. And then, you know, as we kicked off today's show, this reticence to talk about money, um, I feel like all parties can go down a path to your point. Then you you get to an offer and it's just it's not going to work. Everybody loses. Everybody has lost time and the organization is back to square one. And that's a total bummer. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Total so, bummer. But, yeah. But, yeah. But in terms of the various, you know, salaries for the various positions and the research that I did, and, and I encourage folks to take a look, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, which we mention often on awesome. Fundraisers Friday, right? Uh, they have an annual, I want to make sure I get it right, compensation and benefits report uh, that they generate based on survey information. Uh, so they send out surveys and then, it, you know, of course, the responses to that. Uh, so they have something formal that's available for AFP members to really help educate uh, leaders and board members around what's happening in the sector. But that based with other research that I did, when you consider the various roles within a fundraising department, and again, we want to be mindful and honor that we know for some organizations, the executive director is the volunteer coordinator of the fundraiser, everything. So, you know, and I want to honor that, that we have folks that are representing small, medium, and large size mm -hmm. organizations. But those salaries in those various roles can range from $40,000 annually for an entry level position to as much as $180,000. I think I always want to check my notes. Yes, for someone that might be a capital campaign director. So there is such a, a wide range within the various fundraising positions. Uh, and then, of course, you have to consider the geography and the market that you're in and how that uh, does or does not affect uh, the salaries that are being offered. So there's a wide range. There's lots of information online. If you're curious about jumping into the nonprofit space and being a fundraiser. If you're a salesperson, you have a lot of the skill sets uh, necessary. Uh, so if, if you're thinking about jumping in or making a move from your current role, or even if you if you don't want to leave your organization, but you're thinking about, you know, what's appropriate for me and what's my next step as, mm -hmm. I, as I path, you know, as I look at my career path, um, this information can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Well, and I think you're absolutely right in, in to encourage all of our viewers and listeners to do your due diligence, get in there and understand what the market is. Because I think personally, Tony, a lot of times our judgment gets clouded by our passion and we're willing to quote unquote suffer for our art, right? You know, we will be like, yeah, but this is a tough situation and, you know, my partner can can bring in, you know, the, the more money and, and help support things. And I think we can a lot of times talk ourselves into something, right? For sure. I mean, and those are very noble and altruistic approaches to the work that we do, you know, in, in the nonprofit sector. And, and during the course of my career, uh, I've certainly had to weigh that, you know, what is, what can I bring in, you know, and how does that complement or support what my husband is bringing in, you know, and, and those combined, you know, is, is that going to allow us to uh, I'll just, you know, have the lifestyle, basically food and shelter and, and clothing, right? Allow us to have, you know, to have those, those things. Uh, so I, I know for myself personally and a lot of other folks, uh, there, there is that noble altruistic approach to this kind of work. Uh, mm -hmm. I think though, as the sector has matured and as, as leadership uh, has matured, and when I say matured in leadership, I mean a willingness to look at 501c3 as a tax status and not a business model. Uh, right. and the fact that we truly are running really important, vital companies uh, with, within our communities. I think as, as those thought processes have, have matured, uh, again, you know, leadership is, is more willing to, to have conversations around compensation and want to know, you know, from their team members, yeah. you know, how, how they're feeling about that. So. You know, Tony, I think that this is true, that we do have an increased, uh, degree of, professionalism and understanding. And I know we talk about that a lot on the nonprofit show, 
But one of the things that I think is really interesting and that has propelled this uh, navigation towards being more professional and more, um, I mean, just, just more competitive to the labor force is a shrinking labor force, right? You know, when we don't have as many people lined up at the door, sending in all those resumes, and we don't have as many choices for filling our positions or growing our, our talent in an organization, um, I think that we have to then be more strategic and say, okay, what do we do to retain our employees? What do we do to pull new employees in? And how do we offer a compensation package that will lure them or, or bring them in? And so it seems to me that this is kind of one of those market-driven subtleties. I'm going to use the word subtleties that maybe, again, we don't recognize or we don't talk about, but it seems to me that it is um, impacting some of these decisions and some of these approaches. You know, we know with the silver tsunami that we are bleeding off talent. It's retiring. It's wanting to cut back. Um, and we don't have, we haven't done a good job of cultivating that next talent up. And mm -hmm. so the marketplace is, is really, it's shifting right now. I and mean, we're in the middle of it. And so I think these compensation issues um, really pull forward. And, and this is a, it's a big, a big thing to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's move in. And you, you kind of talked about this briefly and alluded to it, that there are benefits inside of a compensation package and what should we be looking for and what should, how should we be evaluating that? Yeah, well, I think it's it's a, another great opportunity. And, and again, I, I apologize for folks that might lean into the shows more often than, than others. There's a little redundancy in, in some of the things that I that I say, but this is another great example when I say one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what I consider a benefit uh, may look very different to someone performing at the same level or, or mm -hmm. in the same role. Uh, some mm -hmm. folks are are going to be clearly driven by money. Money talks, money walks, you know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So they're super motivated by that. Some folks are going to be more motivated by a, a an assurance that there's a work-life balance along with you know, mm -hmm. compensation that supports the value that I'm bringing to the organization. Uh, and that can look many different ways. Uh, one of the things that came out that I want to point out from the, the uh, 2023 AFP survey around compensation and benefits is that 85% of those that responded reported that a flexible work environment is important to them. Mm -hmm. So just that alone, uh, you know, is part of a benefit that you can talk to your employer about. So again, different for everyone, um, but the, you know, the flexibility, uh, you know, health savings accounts, you know, just the, the natural kind of health benefits that folks hope to receive from an employer. Again, for nonprofits, that can be very challenging. A lot of them are a one person shop, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if they're, if they're a small organization. So here, I you know I just want folks to to think creatively, uh, mm -hmm. because always you know the the dollars may not always be there the way that you hoped they would mm -hmm. be there, you know for your compensation. So think about the other things that that bring you joy, that provide you a balance, the other things that motivate you outside of the mission and vision of your organization to get up every day and do this work. Right. You know, Tony, it's so interesting that you would bring that up. Yesterday, I had. The thrill of a lifetime for me. I uh, a bunch of leaders from your part-time controller um, had come to Phoenix, where where we're based, and um, this was the first time I had met them IRL. These are women that I've been working with for more than five years, but I've only seen them, you know, in the box, right? Sure. And uh, so I got to spend several hours with them, and I'm actually going to be talking at uh, speaking at one of their at a conference that they're hosting today later on. And one of the things that all of these women brought up was that throughout the change, and they're all CPAs. So by the way, they're all CPAs. Throughout the change in the trajectory of their work environment, um, they have noticed a change, obviously, in working remotely and dress and then the amount of money that they spent on suits, on, on dressy footwear, 
stockings and dry cleaning. Mm -hmm. And they were all saying, you know, with the way that they work remotely, they still look professional and everything, but the burden of cost associated with how they dressed um, has really been an eye opener. And I thought that was fascinating because again, we don't talk about it, but then, you know, we have those, we have those expenses that we have to bear. And it's not just women. It's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not gender specific, right? Yeah, no, that was just the audience, you know, or who was part of that conversation. And I'm so glad mm -hmm. you mentioned it because true, I think about that and, you know, saving hundreds of dollars a month from, you know, dry cleaning alone, dry cleaning suits, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, constantly. So, uh, so I think that that's a, a really good example. And, and, and board members, aren't going to, and in most cases shouldn't, I'll say, <laughs> offer <laughs> offer to reimburse, you know, folks for, you know, like you're not gonna get a, you know, funds for your attire in, in the yeah. nonprofit. Sorry, I was stumbling there, you know, funds for your attire in the nonprofit mm -hmm. space. So uh so yeah, so again that flexibility and kind of minimizing, you know, those those in face meetings. It's really interesting because we we don't think about it until we're, you know, just it's that little bit of nickeling and dining. And I think a lot of this also has to do with communities where there's um, a mass transit. I mean, look at, you know, communities where you have to, to take a toll bridge or, uh, you know, the toll highways. Somebody was telling me not too long ago that the crossing the San Francisco bridge is like over $30, but, wow. you know, I mean, it, and so if you're going into a, the city to work or whatever, and, you know, there are some really incredible uh, costs that the, that labor has to bear. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of works out. I'm one quick question I have for you as we navigate forward on this conversation is how do we do this when we have different family structures. So for example, maybe we have like um, a single parent and they have to, um, they have considerations about getting, being home for their kids when they get home. Or we have, uh, we have people that don't have children. Um, we have people that want to coach or, you know, want to do things differently. How, how do we make this so that it's equitable, but yet maybe we can customize things or, or are you of the belief that it should all be the same for everybody? Yeah. I, I'm not of the belief that it should be all be the same for everybody. I mean, there, there needs to be standards and, and, and guardrails to ensure that, that whatever the customization might be for a team member isn't so far away from, from others. And I think that, you, you said it very clearly there in using the word equity. And, and so when we hire, when we think about the hiring process, and again, I'm not a talent acquisition expert, but I know in my experience in hiring and, and what I have been uh, trained to do is that when you're interviewing someone, you don't say, do you have kids or do you not have kids? Right. No. You don't ask those questions. No. And you, don't, you don't ask the question no. of how are you going to get to the office every day? Uh, so... So when there are those opportunities to customize a, a uh, package for a single parent, then what you need to realize is that you need to be able to offer the same for every single parent mm -hmm. that is within the organization. So the customization, I think, is important. Uh, there need to be guardrails and, and standards around that. And you need to be willing to accept that if you offer it for one, you need to be able to offer the same to a similar scenario or situation with a mm -hmm. team member. So that's how I that's how I feel about that. Again, I, I I think for us to say that here's a compensation package and and you at 23 will love it and you at 48 will love it and you at 65 will love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think just kind of is is not appropriate in, in today's environment if you mm -hmm. want to get the best talent, if right. you want to get the best talent. And I right. think that that's something folks need to think about. Right. Well, and I love that you said that, you know, the, the path 
that you are on in your life and the journey that you're on and where you are, it changes so dramatically. Um, and so I do think that's an interesting thing to be thinking about and really honoring that. Um, let's talk about this. If, if anything, I think this is the most interesting. This is a da, 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 da moment. Incentives and the issues with the C word. Everybody freaks out <laughs> about commissions. But then when you talk to somebody um, who is in the for-profit sector, commissions rule the world, everybody's on board. I mean, it's so interesting to me that there's such a schism um, between the for-profit and the nonprofit sector on this, of which I understand all the different points. I totally sure. get it, Sure. but it's, it's fascinating to me. And that you're the person that all those years ago taught me the, the phrase cause selling. You know, don't step back from the word selling just because you're in the nonprofit sector. Right. Yeah, it, it, ex exactly. And, and you know, and, and then when we talk about selling, we're talking more so about the process involved in securing a gift. So it's it's not even so much in, in your behaviors or or the way in which you're communicating with a potential donor or investor. It's, it's really around the, you know, the process that you use. And and for folks that uh, subscribe to and, and agree with the Association of Fundraising Professionals Code of Ethics, it clearly states that fundraisers shall not be paid a commission. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Julia, I recently had this conversation with a, a really good friend of mine who I've known a long time, who's in the for-profit space and kind of explaining, you know, the nuances around commission in the nonprofit space and how it's perceived and, and looked at. And she was like, yeah, I don't get it. And I would say something else and she'd say, yeah, but I, I don't get it. <laughs> so, it was like, you know, and so I'd say, but, you know, but then there's this, she'd be like, but yeah, but I don't get it. So, you know, so I tried many different ways to explain why uh, commission is, is perceived the way it is in the nonprofit space. And the best I could get was, yeah, well, I don't get it. So, uh, so, you know, for, and, and again, you know, and this is someone who contributes, you know, to philanthropy. This is someone who is actively engaged in giving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I love that, you know, love that about her. But so when I talked about specifically when I said, well, there is a concern that if I am raising funds based on commission, my motivation may not necessarily be the right motivation for the work that I'm doing. And again, the response was, who cares? Are you raising more money? So, so <laughs> I mean, who cares? Who cares? I mean, are you raising more money? Like, you know, so so uh so you're you're right. It, there there are folks that feel you know differently about this, and there are some that, that are like, again, who cares? And others that are like, absolutely not. Uh, but what is interesting is when we when we think about commission. And what is commission really? It, it's it's sort of a it's sort of a recognition of performance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so in many ways, commission uh, can be framed around bonus. So you know, so you're receiving annual bonus based on your performance. Uh, so the bonus, uh, in most cases, are going to have multiple factors. So it's not only going to be did you meet quota? Did you meet the fundraising goal? But it's also going to include things like your teamwork and, uh, you know, wow. and other kind of, of measurables that, that might go into a, a bonus. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out, and again, I'm reflecting on my notes to make sure I get the numbers right, is that the 2023 AFP Compensation and Benefits Report stated that 68% of the respondents offered bonuses. Okay, wait, say that number again. 68% of the respondents, their organizations offered bonuses. Okay, so I'm going to call it out. I kind of feel like that's secretive. I don't think that we hear enough about that. You know, we get all panicked about commission, but we, we don't talk about getting bonuses. And, and again, yeah, and again, I think it depends on the organization, the size of the organization, right? If, if we're talking about 
higher ed, you're probably oh. more likely to see a bonus structure yes. than you are for, you know, I'm not going to call any, you know, call anybody, but again, for a smaller medium size. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why those other kind of compensation things, whether that be flexibility, time off, you know, whatever are so important uh, because the likelihood of a bonus in those small to medium organizations is, is practically non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in, in that survey, 68% we're, we're offering, you know, we're offering bonuses. So there are ways to compensate folks, you know, for performance uh, and you don't have to use the word commission. Well, I love that you brought that up because I think that, um, you know, if you have the opportunity, I'm going to call you out, Tony Bell. If you have the opportunity to talk with your friend and explain or, you know, say, how would, how would she perceive the word bonus and how would she how would she look at that right it would be very interesting because there's a big difference between the word bonus and and commission um i mean just the sense of it and i i do agree with you about the transactional nature and and how we work in steward donors mm -hmm. um and that is a big fear but this concept of bonusing as long as it's spelled out and I, I really appreciate that you layered in the fact that this has multiple issues. It's not just a number or a, a goal, but it has to do with a lot of other metrics and measurements. Um, I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I yeah, really I mean, it, 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 and, and what you said is important too. It's around other metrics and measurements. And so mm -hmm. we need to we need to make sure that there are systems in place to track all of those that right. they're understood up front. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but the, the tracking of, of, of impact and, and within those metrics and, and those different measurements are, are really important when we have these conversations around yeah. comp compensation or bonuses. Amazing. So, you know, we don't, our, our time is almost up, but I don't want to end our conversation today without something that I find you, um, you bring up a lot and that is advocating for ourselves. Um, as professionals, in moving our our sector forward, what does this look like? Because I I think it's fascinating. You first brought this up to us on Fundraisers Friday when we were talking about annual reviews, mm -hmm. and uh, you had a whole section on how we need to be thinking about how we advocate for ourselves, and not just in that review meeting, but you know the arc of our work and all this. So, what does this look like to you? You know, I'm going to follow that flow, Julia. Thank you for reminding me of that, because what's really important around advocating for yourself, whether it be for compensation or to take a, a, a look at kind of the overall benefits package that you have, is the timing. And okay. when are you going to bring this up and, and, and have this conversation? And usually the best time is around a quarterly review, a mid-year review, or an annual review is when you would want to bring the bring this up. Or if you have just ended a campaign that has been hugely successful, then is a good time as, as well, right? Everyone's feeling great. You, you've proven, again, your, your impact and, and relevance to the organization because you've just finished this remarkable campaign. Uh, so that's a great time to, to bring it up as well. Uh, so first and foremost, think about the timing of when you want to have this conversation. Uh, also making sure that you have lots of documentation to support why it is that you believe that your compensation should be increased, that there should be a bonus structure, or that your overall benefits package should somehow be increased, whether, again, that be increased with additional paid days off or whatever that looks like for reimbursement for gym membership, whatever that looks like for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but having the data to support that is, is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. And then gathering market data. So timing is important. Data on how you are performing, again, and adding relevance. And then just data on the sector. What does it look like? You know, talking, you know, looking at, at the information available through AFP and bringing that into your conversation mm -hmm. so that you, you have some other benchmarks to talk about. Because uh, you might be able to say, currently, I am 30 percent below the average for folks mm -hmm. performing in, with the same job title. 
Uh, so again, just you know, make sure you have other data around what's happening in the sector and those trends to support your conversation. Well, I, I love that you brought that up because I think that's just a generally uh, a good, that's a best practice, right? I mean, understanding what the market looks like and 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 putting your your place, putting yourself into that place, I think is very strategic. And I think we need to know that about ourselves, right? It, it, you know, our organizations need to know it, but we need to know it about ourselves too, right? Mm -hmm. and we talk about increasing our professionalism. I mean, this is a, a big part of that. It, it really, truly is. Well, as always, Tony Bell, you are amazing. You teach me so much. Um, you make everything that we talk about very achievable and logical. And um, I, I think it's incredibly empowering. So I say thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to say thank you, thank you very much to our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and Your Part-Time Controller. Spoiler alert, we have two new sponsors coming in. You're going to be seeing them shortly. Yay team, which we're very, yeah, we're very excited to be uh, introducing them next week. So Tony Bell, you've given me a lot to think about as I end up a very busy week, and I'm so appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, too, Julie. Again, always a pleasure, and I look forward to next week. Me, too. Next week is going to be really interesting because we're going to be talking about um, how we look at ourselves as professionals, and if you are thinking about becoming a professional fundraiser, What's that trajectory going to look like? So that's an episode not to be missed. If you're trying to cultivate somebody into your, you know, your line of work, or maybe you've identified somebody in your organization who you think would be a good crossover. I think it's going to be a riveting conversation. I really do. So as we end each and every episode of the nonprofit show, we want to remind our viewers, our listeners, ourselves to stay well so you can do well.